There are many ways that the duties of parenthood are performed in the natural world. In ecology, RK selection theory explores the trade-off of quantity of offspring and quality of investment. Animals like turtles and mice that perform an extreme R selection have a high quantity of offspring and leave once the eggs are laid or shortly after babies are born. Exemplars of K selection, like humans, orcas, and elephants, have very few offspring and invest a lot of time and energy into preparing them for adulthood. These parenting strategies often come with lifestyle trends. K selection strategists tend to have longer lifespans, larger body size, and juveniles tend to have exaggerated features like large eyes to endear themselves to parents. Many animals, particularly mammals, fall somewhere in the middle, investing some effort into a few offspring every year. Some animals, like octopuses and salmon, have many offspring and invest a lot in preparing them to the point that most mothers die shortly after the first hatching. The term comes from an equation on population dynamics, wherein R represents the maximum growth rate and K represents the carrying capacity. In loose terms, R selection specialists invest in maximum potential growth, a strategy that does better in unstable ecosystems where carrying capacity is inconsistent. K strategists tend to thrive in stable ecosystems where they invest in having a strong population at the ecosystem's capacity. RK selection theory has come under valid criticism for oversimplification, but I think it's a useful tool in understanding trends in parenting style. Although mammals tend towards K selection and reptiles usually invest in R selection, there is a lot of overlap. Eagles are typical K selection specialists with long investment in a few offspring, and rabbits follow the trends of R selection with large litters and minimal parental care. Although often not discussed, Plants actually serve as better examples of the extremes. Dandelion plants will cast hundreds if not thousands of seeds into the air, while many cycads only have a single seed every few years. In our megafaunal ecologies on Earth, we are used to thinking of large mammals as slower-growing K strategists. Whales, terrestrial ungulates, and elephants often take many months to several years of pregnancy and take care of their offspring as long or longer than gestation. A lot of mammal predators, like cats and dogs, tend to split the difference between strategies, having a litter of a few offspring and caring for them until adulthood in some capacity, especially longer in social species. Although some chimeran dinosaurs, like firebirds, are case strategists, most invest heavily in R selection. Our bias might make us think that K selection is the superior method, but in many contexts, especially highly competitive or unstable ones, having many offspring that can fend for themselves early on is superior. A drought might hit and strain a majority of the population, but the dinosaurs will rebound quickly while the competing mammals struggle to repopulate, which can make all the difference and the slightest advantage can result in localized extinctions. The context of the known world tends to favor our selection, which is a factor in dinosaurs' continued dominance despite the constant wave of invasive mammals. For the next part of this episode, I would like to explore five chimeran animals that range across this spectrum. First is the Ardzu, an extreme R selection strategist. These diapsids will lay up to 200 eggs in several clutches. They barely scrape debris before laying, with some in trees, on rocks, or under logs. Once the eggs are laid, the mother leaves to feed and regain her strength. Two inch long young of the entire regional population all hatch on the same day, signaled by building chorus of screams. This mass hatch floods the local ecology. All of them screaming does certainly draw in more predators, but hatching all at once means that they tend to overwhelm and inevitably many escape assisted by climbing into nearby trees and gliding into the wind on fan-like tails. Next up are the titanosaurs. Although we will be looking at the island-hopping Wawakoku today, the basic strategy is also employed by the mainland Chimeran Titans. A herd of females will come to an island. They feed on a range of vegetation and clear the trees. As they feed, the herd calls out and males gather from across the sea. Bulls clash in violent duels until a few victors emerge, their number determined by the size of the herd. One male might remain for a herd of a dozen females, 
while herds of over 100 will support many. These victors mate with the females, and when they lay their eggs, all the adult titans depart. Some of the yearlings in the herd remain behind, feeding on what little foliage remains and providing passive protection. Although the island initially appears devastated, it has in truth been primed for rebirth. Dung from the herd fertilizes a thicket of nutritious gymnosperms which are ready for the mass hatching a few months later. Thousands of juveniles hatch and spend the next month or so gorging themselves on ferns and cycads. Once the island is depleted once more, the juveniles disperse. Most follow the yearlings and form new herds, some make small troops of their own, while others strike out alone. This diversity in strategy is critical to their success. There is safety in numbers, but numbers also draw predators, so having enough offspring to hedge their bets means that there's a good chance that some of the young will reach adulthood regardless of what happens. Although titanosaurs may at first seem like uninvested parents, they do invest quite a lot of energy in making sure that the young are provided with at least the first few months of food before striking out on their own. An example of an animal splitting the difference is most robust monarch Megaraptorans. The Uktan is a dedicated K strategist and their offspring are cared for up to two decades, and the more basal Megaraptorans provide almost no care. But the Zentar, for example, will provide for and guard their young for four to six months. Once young are able to hunt on their own, they are driven off so that the mother can bulk up and mate again. This gives young Zentar a solid foundation and defense at their most vulnerable time of life, but they are expected to go off and fend for themselves. They will spend the next decade as small game specialists, remaining under half a ton and taking in the cast of their environment. They become familiar with the beasts that one day will be their prey, observing how sloths defend themselves, when elephants are most aggressive, and when ruts and births make each type of animal vulnerable. This is a critical period in their lives, and one they must endure alone. Once they reach adolescence, they gain a ton every year until they become the largest predator in their ecosystem. It is then that the real trial begins. They must prove that they have made the most of this early education. Mortality is high in this proving period. Those who reach adulthood are familiar and confident in what they kill, making for extremely efficient predators. The giant buffalo is a keystone species on the Housie Prairie. This massive bovid lives in vast herds, feeding on the low-nutrient Housie grass and fertilizing the ground, improving its productivity and floral diversity with their grazing. The gestation of the giant buffalo is nearly two years, and young remain with their mothers for the first two to three years of their life, around twice as long as their closest living relative on Earth, the African buffalo. While calves are not cared for as diligently once a new sibling is born, they often remain with their mother for another two to three years. Males then leave to join bachelor groups while females integrate into the herd on their own. Cows have their first calf at around eight years old, and bulls tend to not reach full maturity until they hit 10 to 12 years. Normally, such a long gestation wouldn't be viable given how many predators are in the ecosystem, but living in complex herds affords a lot of protection that wouldn't be sustainable in smaller groups. Herds will form ranks around young, and especially when young are around, bulls will gather and charge. Considering bulls can reach two tons in older specimens, this is a pretty insurmountable defense. Even so, hunting giant buffalo is how most Sebaldos Uktan find their mate and start families. Other predators target young buffalo, but having the protection of the herd means for a fairly stable and high rate of survival, making this strategy viable. The ecological rewards are noticeable, and they have outcompeted most other bovids and other grass specialists in their size class. Last but not least is our K selection specialist, the Angaru. These massive apes are the largest Chimeran primate and live for around a century. Although Gigantopithecus is found in Chimere, the Angaru is of a distinct Pongene lineage. They are only found in the highlands of Picardia. Angaru are highly intelligent, making use of a wide range of tools. Females live in small groups of related animals and their offspring, and are led by a matriarch, 
with a single adult male present for mating and protection. Young are dependent on their mothers for 15 years or more, and females rarely have their first child until they're 20, sometimes older. Somewhat unusual among apes, fathers will play an active role in parenting, likely because paternity is fairly certain, and they will protect offspring of previous relationships or the matriarch will see them off. Females with a mate are violently hostile towards unknown males, which is why females are armed with impressive canines, although weapons are also employed for the task. The matriarch chooses the male to be the mate with their troop, and around every 15 years or so, she will see off their male and choose a new mate to promote genetic diversity. Similar to orangutans, males don't grow their long fur or flanged white cheeks until they have earned the approval of a matriarch, although they are retained once they are driven off. Matriarchs will often prefer a new mate with flanges since it means that they were approved of by another matriarch. The complex social dynamic may not be necessary for their extreme case selection, with offspring depending on their mother for up to two decades, but it seems to have evolved as a reaction to the unprecedented size, nearly three-year gestation, and overall long lives of these apes. The benefits and complications of quantity versus quality in parental care is a topic I obviously find fascinating. As is often the case in nature, there isn't really a perfect strategy, and the diversity of parenting methods shows that there are many ways to find success. Mother's Day is in a few days. My mother's pretty fantastic and put in a lot of effort to cultivate my passions in both storytelling and the natural world, and I wouldn't be here talking about this project if it wasn't for her support. Gratitude to my new patrons in April. Your support is how I'm able to continue doing these episodes. Thanks to my mom, and thank you all for watching. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks.